Hi, everybody. I'm delighted to be with you. And I wish we are going to have um, one hour of intensive discussion about education, about higher education, about some of the challenges, regarding some of the challenges that we have faced during the last 12, 16 months or so. Um, and I will reflect on some of the interesting trends that probably many of them didn't start because of the pandemic, but they have been increasingly accelerated. Um, I will refer in some cases to US higher education context, but also will connect with uh, some um, recent studies from the EU, and I will refer in each one of the cases. For those who are just joining, my name is Cristobal Cobo, um, and I think we are ready to start. So today we are going to use the black box thinking to think about higher education. And probably one of the big questions we have is, what is the black box that we have today in higher education? Is it revenue? Is this the student's graduation rate? Are the salaries of the graduates when they are hired? Is the quality of the research? I think we all know that in the airline industry, failure is taken very seriously. Every craft is equipped with an almost indestructible black box. So when there is an accident, the box is open, the data is analyzed, and the reasons for the accidents are very carefully analyzed. Now, this ensures that the same mistake doesn't, doesn't happen again, and then the industry creates a safety record which is incredibly high. Now, most of us tend to have a very challenging relationship with failure. It's difficult to, uh, to acknowledge failure, or we struggle to learn from it. And the most important driver of success in any field is acknowledgement of failure and the willingness to engage with it. This is how we learn, this is how we progress, and failure and success are very closely related. So we can bring today the black box thinking into different fields. In this case, we're gonna use the black box of education after the first 16 months of this pandemic. So let's dive into that. I think the let me highlight some of the challenges that higher education has been facing in these difficult months. Probably we can start with the major challenges in terms of the cash flow. As institutions have lost significant student fees, incomes from research, training, events, consulting, and other sorts of revenue. Now, on the top of that, many universities have had to face unexpected expenses such as refunding the students' rooms, the cleaning operations, and why not to mention the growing investing on investment on technology. Now, access also has been a challenge. For instance, in the US, up to 20% of the college students have issues accessing technology and having, in order to have reliable high-speed internet. To move to online only classes for instruction prompt concerns about the quality of the remote learning. And on the top of that, so those are students who were already having some um, academic struggles, now they have been really suffering on the online context. Now, other thing that has been changing significantly in many universities around the world has been the grading systems. So schools are shift to pass or fail grading systems instead of the standard letter of grades, which could lead to potential complications for the students' credit transfer and the graduates when they graduate. In the US, for instance, the freshman enrollment in the last fall 2020 declined by 13%. This enrollment decline obviously varies according to institutions. In the concept of the US again, the public two years institutions have seen the largest decline in the first time students enrollment of 21%. That is followed by the public college and the universities in 8%. This is according to information from the National Students Clearing Clearinghouse data. Now, new international students enrollment, and I think this is remarkable, new international students enrollment dropped by 43%, equivalent to 3 billion uh, loss in terms of revenue. Now, the pandemic has heavy hit the worst, um, those who were more fragile, but also in terms of institutions, those who were less prepared. Now, that's on the other side has been massively benefiting those who were already well developed, which already have a number of institutional capacities well developed. And I think this should be understood as an urgent reason for acceleration, forcing institutions to radically change how they operate and deliver their education experience. 
So universities are offering in some cases low income students more flexible scheduling or reduce the course load requirements to easy to transition for students who want to spend more time with the families or who need to earn money to support themselves or their families. Online offer possibilities of dropping the cost and including students from disadvantaged groups. Now, in most cases, and we will discuss now, now that in, in the Q&A, but in most cases, the reorganization of the courses and the lessons online was not the result of a well-planned instructional design process. Simply offering remote learning via live Zoom classes, as we are having now, is a method that has evolved very little in terms of video conferencing from the late 1990s. Probably some of you have heard about Zoom fatigue, right? Now, lectures, in many cases, they have struggled to switch to full online learning. In many cases, I have to say, it looks much more like an emergency plan than really a transformative learning experience. And I think the big question or the elephant in the room, if you like, is why are we going to go to the same physical space, in other words, the classroom, if the goal is one talk and the rest look at their phone? Can we really take advantage of the crisis to offer a more transparent integration of in-person and blended learning? If so, probably that transformation should not be limited to resting the use of the time and the space, which is important, of course, but also deeper changes, a multi-platform learning, virtual mobility, a multidisciplinarity learning experience, a self-managed learning with higher levels of students' agency, and probably a different way of teaching. Now, I think this is an opportunity to prepare students for a world that has shifted significantly towards flexible work, an opportunity to rethink diversity, equity, and the sense of belonging. It's important to resist to return to the comfort of the pre-pandemic norms. And I think the challenge is to find a balance between allowing greater flexibility for remote learning while retain, retaining the most vital face-to-face -face interaction in the campus life. So in a, in a word, this is a little bit of the best of each world. And this combination is not trivial. So today probably is still too early to open this black box. But we can say that according to the trends, this test optional admission is quite likely here to stay. At the same time, universities are expected to offer more online courses options and hopefully more collaboration between the different departments. Opportunities for virtual internship will become more common and more faculties and staff will have the opportunity to work from home. Hire more remote first staff such as, for instance, the University of the People, the world's first nonprofit tuition free American accredited online university with 65,000 students. And the staff they have is spread all over the world. Faculties are in some countries, the IT is in India, and the management is another country. So, this is this idea of the, the humans in the cloud, I think, is something that we can discuss and reflect on. Now, before the pandemic, there used to be this tension between the platform university versus the liberal university. And I think it's important today to stop talking so much about the delivering, how we deliver education, and much more about the engagement, which I think is the central. The idea of the platform university is not new. It has been for years, universities have been integrating and discussing how technology can add value to the education, and not in the other way around. But in most cases, digital transformation has been extremely difficult for education. The concept, the concept of digital first thinking, this shift toward an organizational culture which embraces opportunities offered by digital technologies and shape activities and practice, but also understand the limitations of technology is something essential. Digital is leading toward a disruptive trend, which is we are having a global audience where some of the universities see themselves really as platform universities where better data is their key asset. So again, using the, the context of the US, the average price of four-year college degree has jumped over 15 times, 15 times in the last 
40 years. I mean, no wonder that universities like Georgia Tech has decided to pioneer with integration of AI-based teaching assistants in online degree programs. And probably the workforce will depend on this ability of cultivating learnability in a much more flexible way. So rather than displaying lots and lots of credential, a continuous process of validating and recognizing the continuous learning. So therefore, probably we have to move away from the one and done degree towards a lifelong learning approach, upskilling as an opportunity of creative alignment between workforce and education. In this report that you see in the screen, a research center suggests the idea of the Netflix university. I know it sounds awful, but while I was preparing this, this presentation, I saw this gigantic merge between to you plus edX, which is a clear example of this idea of the Netflix University. And the author suggests that they can reduce the cost, they can increase the total number of subscribers or the global audience, they have good content curation and recommendation, they're data intensive, transferable college credits or credentials for a monthly subscription, and they retain the users through continued value generation. Now, this idea of hybrid and remote arrangements are quite likely here to stay, not only because of COVID, because they were here before and they have been on the rise for the last couple of years. Second, universities are quickly changing their view. Sorry, employers are quickly changing their view towards online native institutions as a result. In the next couple of years, at least the last three or four years, all professionals will have in their training at least one full year of online learning. And this is quite likely to be a game changer. So there's a mismatch today between the jobs people want and the jobs that are today actually available on the market. People want higher levels of flexibility. Now, in that context, the new models, not very new, but increasingly transformational models are going and are gaining prominence. Faster, cheaper, specialized, just in time, skills and knowledge. So in this context, higher education needs to find more effective, efficient ways to educate students. Without, and this is important, without sacrificing the rigor of the human interaction and feedback. Holon IQ developed this chart that you see in the screen. Let me give you some figures to have a, a quick understanding of that. The MOOCs, for instance, have attracted almost 500 million visits from learners around the world, 500 million. In the last 30 days, so 380 million students today are taking over 30,000 courses from over 1,000 universities globally. Unlike what I used to think before the pandemic, MOOCs were never dead. This is not a comeback. If you have a look of the last figures from, for instance, December 19 till December, um, 2020, the enrollment has really skyrocketed. So in the case of, uh, for instance, Coursera, they moved from 45 million to 75 million students. In the case of edX, before, before this joint venture, uh, they transitioned from 24 million to 35 million. So the numbers are staggering. And now with the combination between to you plus edX, this 800 million in cash combination, which will have uh, a global um, total of um, 50 million learners from 230 partners is there's a lot of questions to what extent this could be an aggregated trend that we will see in the future. Now, if there's something that we have learned is students demand higher levels of flexibility, but flexibility in all sorts of sense. For instance, in terms of ethics, higher education institutions will be increasingly demanded to be accountable for diversity, equity and inclusion metrics to reduce disparity. College and universities are expected to continue offering fully online and hybrid learning and probably more flexibility in the assessments. But at the same time, employers will continue moving toward non-degree education and non-traditional degrees. Let me give you an example. Google, for instance, offer tech certificates equivalent to a degree in the hiring process. And this initiative has been supported by 130 other companies. So today you will find 250,000 people 
who have now taken their certificates. And Google, for instance, will treat that certificate as an equivalent of a four years degree. That's one approach or example of flexibility. Another one is a full combination of pedagogical models that we find today. Fully face-to-face, face-to-face and discussions uh, remotely, or having breakout sessions remotely and working face-to-face, or having the lab online, or having this idea of the flex plan where the learners can alternate according to their needs and their context. Let me give you another, another approach that I think is interesting and also has emerged in the context of the pandemic, the London Interdisciplinary School. This is a small university, a new university that has decided to bring students and, and faculties with a very specific purpose, to help them to sort problems from an interdisciplinary perspective. So all the students receive quantitative and qualitative research methods to understand any kind of problem. So the university has designed a number of key global problems such as mental health, inequality on technology and ethics, and they analyze that from the richness of different perspectives. Is this the approach for everybody? Probably not. Probably you will have, and you will need people with specific, specific backgrounds and disciplines. But at the same, having this kind of view, which is much more compelling in terms of much more transfer hair cell, I think that can be an interesting approach. And this university, although it was designed as a face-to-face, -face, they are now inquiring, what will be the, the added value to bringing students in the classroom if we only expect them to listen to what we say? So this has been an interesting combination to think how they can transform and learn out, out of this crisis. So let, let, me, let me give you another example of the tra transformation that we have seen in the last in the last time. This idea of uh, personalization and rethinking the learning experience. For instance, the Bolton College in the UK, they decided to integrate this robot ADA or ADA. Um, or in the McMaster University in Canada, they did something similar with a chatbot. And you may say, well, but the chatbot has a number of limitations. No question out of that. But they say that this chatbot is helping them to answer 80,000 emails, 70 plus thousand phone calls, and 37, 37 in, um, in person visits using IBM 24 seven services from Watson with fairly high levels of satisfaction. Is this going to revolutionize education? Well, I don't know. We have to be careful because we, as the Amara's law said, we tend to overestimate the short-term impact of technology, in this case, AI, and we underestimate effects in the long run. And I think just the opposite happened with, with humans. We sometimes neglect the importance and capacity of humans to change and transform. Now, I think in this context, that's why it's so important to have a look at what the, the Buckingham University is doing with this Institute for Ethical AI in Education. The more advanced the technologies are, the more opaque they become. So there, therefore, it's super important to have um, a good understanding of the ethic tensions that the integration of technology will have in the learning. Now, although is, there's an increasing level of awareness on that regard, I think one of the challenges we have today is that tech ethics it tend to be fairly vague, and you can hardly connect this, how that can be used in this complex tension between social discussions and technology. And I think the, the challenge today is to move beyond the, what is called the ethic washing and try to find better social technical approaches to combine different voices and perspectives that can integrate the vision uh, of different needs in a highly fragmented environment, which is massively interested in accelerating the role of AI and other technologies in society. Now, when we see the global uh, trends, we know by 2025, we will have 1 billion people having a post-secondary qualification. 1 billion people that will be expanded to other 280 million by the end of this decade. So no wonder that studies recent done a couple of a couple of months ago in almost 400 universe, uh, almost 400 higher education institutions in the EU mentioned that about 50% of the institutions indicate a growing demand for short blended learning courses. Non-degree purpose, and in some cases, supported and endorsed by these micro-credentials, which is a topic that I want to bring into the discussion. 
So we were mentioning the case of Google a minute ago, but we have, for instance, uh, Skills Build, this academy done by IBM, or we have the Network Academy elaborated by, by Cisco, or the Global Skills Initiative by Microsoft. In all these cases, um, you will see a trend that is quite interesting. All of them are sustained under the idea that employers' expectations um, are increasing in terms of having a staff that is highly proficient in the use of IT or ICT. Two out of three of all new jobs created since 2010 require high or medium or at least medium levels of digital skills. So this idea of the four year inst inst institution financial models and are under huge pressure and higher ed promise to open opportunities in the job market proves to be false for too many students, either they're unemployed or underemployed. And in this context, Amazon future engineers aim to inspire the students for underrepresented communities to engage in computer science and coding. So no wonder this is a trend that is gaining attention and interest. But I have to bring a caveat here. One thing is to offer through these academies um, a quick to develop skill that might be highly rewarded in the short term in the market, providing a, a map to move from the point A to the point B, which is great. But we all know that these languages evolve very quickly. And the question is, what will be the cost of investing short-term grading or short-term proficiency if you know that many of this knowledge will be out of date? So the caveat is maybe it's important to, in, on the top of helping people to move from the point A to point B with the map, we will have to also give the compass, which will help you to navigate in uncharted territories, which is as most of the people do when they develop more um, transformational and deep capacities of critical thinking and, and self-learning that might go far beyond a specific capacity of uh, a one a language of programming. So let me say, let me stop for a second on, on the micro-credentials. The industry is increasingly endorsing the value of these credentials, and I think this can be an opportunity for a better alignment between employers and education. But again, there are some caveats. Um, will this hyper-fragmentation of courses where the rationale is a quick stop and go affect the social experience between learners because they will have very little interaction between them and they will be changing courses? I think this is something that we should explore and take into account. Now, other thing that I wanted to mention on the, on the credentials is on the one side, you see the literature that today say that over 60 million credentials have been issued since the creation of the Open Budgets 1.0 in 2012. And as, at the same time, the same survey that I mentioned a minute ago on the EU done early this year for on almost 400 higher education institutions, 77% of them mentioned that they don't use any kind of digital badge. So I don't know you, but I see a kind of parallel universe between the high enthusiasts from the industry and the reality that it might not be entirely aligned with that. Now, other trend that is very interesting that we all have been witness of um, is this idea of the working from home. So there is a, the emergence of the so-called the Donna effect. People would like to live in the suburbs of the cities because in, in some cases, or in most of the cases, I would say today, they are opening the chance to co go to the downtown one or two or max three days per week so they can do most of the work at home. Um, and this certainly offers a number of opportunities in terms of investing less time on commuting, but also we will have to recalibrate how people work from home. And I, and I found this interesting study quite old, I have to say, from 1990, which highlights some of the challenges of remote work. And I want to read them for you to see if that resonates in some of your experience. Not having the necessary equipments, family interactions, uh, mixing work and family life. Distracted households um, experiences and lack of interaction with coworkers. So, if you see all these problems, they are new problems. They are not new problems. These are all problems, are behavioral problems that we have had for years. So, despite that we might have new technologies, we are facing fairly similar and old problems on remote learning. Now, before the pandemic, um, in this study collected from 40,000 students across the US, we could see that the blended learning was already here. Probably the blended learning was much more relevant in the homework 
or in the assignments, such as flipped classroom. Now, um, in the case of lectures, lectures were much smaller, and this is quite likely something that will be expanded. I do believe, and the for, for coming transformation, that will look much more like the right hand side chart from an um, anonymous university. Pre COVID, most was in, on campus. During COVID, most has been off campus. And probably, it's hard to say, but probably post COVID, um, we will see a better combination between on and off campus in a much more organic way. But I don't think, and this is important, I don't think this is only a matter of technology. Let me share with you this study done by a number of, of researchers from the MIT. They decided to implement a nervous system activity tracker. So they were tracking the brain activity of people from different ages doing physical, cognitive, and emotional tasks. But in this case, the focus has to be on sleep the activities that they were doing in terms of studying, doing homework, or taking exams. And interestingly, this brain activity sensor that people were carrying found that when students were attending classes, the brain activity was as flat as when they are watching television, way more flat than when they were uh, sleeping. And I think this says a lot about the challenges we have ahead. I think it's important, as the Patrick Lynch mentioned, it's critical that to keep in mind that understanding is not the kind of cognitive ability that is exercised when you're passively receiving information. And the challenge we have is these technologies are so efficient for transferring information and building a complex thinking will require more than having access to information. That's why this idea of Mary Roach, I think is critical. We learn when we forget meaning that the best, one of the best ways of keeping something in our memory is when we have the possibility of retrieving back something that we forgot and we use it and we apply it. Second, we really learn when we have the opportunity to teach, to teach somebody else. So the only way of having command on something is when you have the possibility of transferring what you have learned to another person, maybe not the only, but a critical one. So if we keep that into account, learning is really a restless exercise when we combine experiences, when we mix up the old knowledge or our experience with new knowledge, when we combine the focus and the diffuse, when we combine theory and practice, and all these trends really require a transformational design of the remote learning experience. So remember this survey that I was mentioning a minute ago, I think, uh, let me bring the final result. Um, this one done on over almost 400 higher education institutions in the EU. They say that the top barrier, universities mentioned that the top barrier to digitally enhanced learning is the lack of staff resources. So there are a few things that we have to take into account here. One is to stay away from those ed tech and venture capitalists that say that only with dumping technology we will make the transformation. Number two, it's critical to keep into account that if we simply replicate the in-person teaching, it's not going to be a, a, a transformative learning experience. But there are other things that are probably even deeper, a different relationship with knowledge. Faculties are not anymore responsible of providing all the sources um, for learning because there's so much happening elsewhere and universities can better be integrated in that regard. But also we have a deep challenge here. Most of the instructors haven't experienced themselves a digital learning experience. So much less a multi-channel, fully collaborative environment. And that really brings a bridge, uh, an important gap that is not technological, it's an experiential gap. So some studies that uh, I will anonymize here mention among faculties that some of the reasons for not changing among faculties um, or not wanting to develop, for instance, digital skills are too old to learn new technologies, not interested to learn, uh, or there's no financial or professional incentives, or I will not it will not have any kind of impact in my annual evaluation, or I don't have the time or the interest. So let me start bringing the conclusions before we will open the floor for conversation. And I think it's not enough to try to uh, protect the institutions as they, they have been for centuries and trying to claim that the status quo is a more important thing. I think today is a uh, fantastic opportunity to reflect on the challenges that we have faced for the last 12, 16 months. And as the old um, Einstein used to say, 
before rushing to bring a robot or to uh, provide trainings, I think we will have to um, carve out the idea of understanding deeply what is the problem. So let's focus on the problem before designing solutions. I think it's the best favor that we can do to make the best of this time. So the first kind of trend that I will highlight is today is a great opportunity to create this sense of urgency for bold actions, getting everyone involved. This is an opportunity to develop really inspirational visions of the future. Um, and therefore, we will have to bring a lot of voices and visions into the panel. So that will, that will be, it will be critical to have not only faculties and students, but also employers, regulators, and technology providers, and to brainstorm a new design of what are the transformations that we would like to sustain after the pandemic. The third kind of key element that I think is critical is how can we establish a data-driven organizational baseline? Meaning, what are the changes that we need to incorporate to make a better use of the data? Understanding what could be the affordance, the opportunities, but at the, time, at the same time, what are the challenges? And we will have a, a discussion uh, tomorrow in a webinar for those who would like to, to join us. The fourth element, I think, is this idea of enabling much more flexible opportunities for micro learning, protect quality, prepare students, but also design a strategy that can be future proof. Investment on R&D, institutional capacities that can help us to better combine the best of both worlds. And finally, this idea that the skills are, the are evolving quickly. The demand of the skills is, evol is evolving very quick quickly. So we will require to design and adopt much more flexible dynamics, ways of recognizing, promote, and develop these capacities. Let me, let me close with this phrase from um, Henry Chesburg, which was almost 20 years ago, who said, the shift in the knowledge landscape is disturbing the people familiar with the earlier paradigm. So I, I think I'm gonna stop here and we will open the floor for questions and, and conversations. Thank you very much. Uh, so there are so many questions, um, but um, I, before going into the questions, if there's someone who would like to raise your hand, you will be more than welcome to, to share um, a comment. Um, let's see. We have um, we have here Susie. Uh, Susie, I'm gonna un unmute you so you can Hello. you can. Okay, awesome. Please go ahead. Hello, Christabel. How wonderful that you should be with us here again at Edgeland 2021. It's just so amazing to hear you. And I Thank would you. like to ask you how you institution diversity SIVU hosted by Professor Shabi Zaidi as a truly insightful platform for medical education, especially in continuing professional development when medicine is a very hands-on type of profession. So Susie, the question is how we how we promote diversity? Yes, I would like to ask you about the relevance of institutions like the Sadiq International University, which has a platform for medical uh, learning and continuing professional development. And of course, what I'm looking at is the practical hands-on way in which medical students need to learn profession that's that's a great question um so we we work in an in a context uh, um, in a in a in a world that is extremely change resistant um and most of the key components of the university has evolved very little in the last couple of centuries and that's not necessarily something bad because tradition really add value to uh, to the learning experience. And there are a few things that we know work well. We know that a good lecture should not be replaced. 
as, as Susie is saying, we know that hands-on learning, experiential learning, will really make a click in your brain because you will connect with the experience, with your skills, and will go far beyond acquisition of, acquisition of uh, information. Now, some of the challenges we have is we either have so much interest in transferring high quality knowledge that sometimes the hands-on, there's no time for the hands-on or we, we don't value in the same, in the same relevance of um, the theoretical knowledge. And I do believe that these ideas of credentials or whatever sort of validation of this experiential knowledge, I think should have the same kind of value because when we encounter people with different views of, of understanding this messy reality, we will have to adjust accordingly. Um, and, I, and I think the more opportunities we offer in breaching the theoretical analysis that happen in the classroom the, and this more, much more uh, experiential, full of mistakes, as I was mentioning on the black box idea, we will have more opportunities to adjust. I, I think it's much easier to remember the mistake than, than the, the thing that we have done well. So breath, building more opportunities and recognizing how would our universities will facilitate the hands-on learning, I think we will be in a better shape. And I think, for instance, the interdisciplinary institutes that try to address problems which are relevant for the communities in which they are emerged, they are really in a much more beneficial position to address in that direction. 